this as well. Um, but this morning, um, uh, we're concluding, I believe, this series on the Holy Spirit. And, um, and, uh, and as, um, as Jenny uh, has said, we're gonna, yeah, you're going to be spending a wonderful time this evening as well, encountering him again and just, um, just pressing into what he has for you as a church. And um, as we conclude, I wanted us to think this morning about the church um, being sent in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because um, as we've looked at, um, the Holy Spirit baptizes us, and um, he baptizes us for a purpose. The uh, Holy Spirit gives gifts. He releases gifts in the church, and he gives these gifts for a purpose. And I was reminded as I was preparing for this of, of Jesus himself going in Luke 4, and he stands in the synagogue, and he says, he quotes those words from Isaiah, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because... Because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed fleet free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Because the Holy Spirit is upon us and has anointed us for a purpose. And, um, and so we're going to think about this together. The church is a, um, is a sent community. And um, one of, one of my, it's one of my favorite things to think about is, is how we are sent by the risen Lord Jesus. Um, our word mission, it comes from uh, the Latin word missio, which means to send. And so as I was preparing for this, I just thought I'm, gonna, I'm just going to Google this word. I'm going to find out a bit about like, the etymology of it, you know, the origins of the word, um, or at least in its English usage. And I found out some interesting things. There's a website. It's called The Etymology Nerd. Okay, uh, is that hands up if you're an etymology nerd? Are there any among us? Yeah, there is a few around. Excellent. And, um, and it said this, it said, when the noun mission was borrowed into the English language in a 1513 theological text, it referred exclusively to God sending Jesus onto earth. Around 1598, a new definition emerged describing Jesuits who were sent to Europe and a few decades later, it was broadened to anyone being sent anywhere with a purpose. The word always had to do with sending, though, and that's because it derives from the Latin missio, which is what we said, meaning sending. And then Google. If you look up a word, Google analyzes words. Who's seen this? Anyone seen this in Google? And it tells you about their usage over time. And that's interesting. And it says this of the origins of the word mission. It says, its origins are mid-16th century, denoting the sending of the Holy Spirit into the world from the Latin missio, from matere, sent. This is Google. Google's giving us some good theological um, information here. And, um, and, you know, I think the original use in the English language actually reflects the origins of the word biblically as well, quite well. So what do I mean? If we think about us as a church being sent... Um, as, as like a missional community sent in the power of the Holy Spirit. We've got to understand who's doing the sending. And God is a, is a missionary God. He's a sending God, and he's a sent God as well. If you read the Gospel of John, you learn that, that God the Father sent um, his Son not to condemn the world, but to save the world. John 3.17 tells us this. And then Jesus goes on to describe himself as sent in almost every chapter of the gospel. And we've got to see the significance of this. You know, John's gospel is the sent gospel. Chapter four, the next chapter, Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Chapter five, the father who sent me has testified himself concerning me and so on. Read it yourself. You're just, it's great just to explore how many times this word and this term comes up. Uh, and then uh, chapter 14, Jesus starts to speak about how um, he and the Father will send the Holy Spirit when Jesus has ascended. And then in chapter 17, when Jesus prays for his disciples before his death, he, he speaks of how he has sent his disciples into the world. And finally, in chapter 20, after Jesus' resurrection, he says, As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. There's a connection here. And, and this is a groundbreaking statement. It's life-defining for us as followers of Jesus. And it's world-changing. This is, this is how the movement, the church, was, was birthed in the power of the Spirit. And we start to read about what that looks like in the book of Acts. 
So if you had to pick a key verse for the whole of the book of Acts that plots the shape and the entire story that's yet to come, it's surely got to be Jesus' last words to his disciples in Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, he doesn't just stop with the power. You know, the word, um, the word actually in the Greek is dunamis, which means, you know, it's, it's like... It's where we get dynamite from. You know, this power is it's explosive. It's expansive. It, it thrusts you out. You know, it, it, you can't, it, it's, it's not kind of like a nice, you know, I mean, sometimes the Holy Spirit, yeah, it, we, it's, we get a wonderful sense of God's presence and it is a wonderful feeling, but it's not just that. It's, it, the Holy Spirit then sends us out. You know, if you ever encounter God's presence and power in, in you know, in, in kind of greater measure, you should always be asking God, God, what's, what's next? You know, there's a, there's a why, there's a, there's a purpose, uh, and God wants to send us out, and it's like dynamite. Uh, and you see in Acts 2, don't you, that the nations come to Jerusalem on Pentecost to celebrate this Jewish festival, and the Holy Spirit's poured out on the disciples, and Peter preaches, and, and it results in 3,000 people being saved and, um, and the church in Jerusalem, we read at the end of that chapter, it grows with people added to their number daily. And then following a miraculous healing, so another move of the Spirit in Acts 3, Peter then again, he's sharing the gospel. And we read in Acts 4 that the result of this is the church grows to 5,000. And um, but then there's a backlash and Peter and John are dragged before the religious authorities. But what happens in Acts 4, it says Peter is filled with the Spirit and he begins sharing with them as well. And, um, and, and then they let them go eventually. They think, oh, you know, how can we hold these people? And then the believers pray at the end of Acts 4. And what happens? The Spirit fills them again. And then what's, what it says is they spoke the word of God boldly. In Acts 5, you see the church in Jerusalem continuing to move in signs and wonders, um, increasingly so, but resistance also increases. And then in Acts 6, as this growing church is meeting the growing needs of the, the poor around them, um, seven deacons are chosen to head up this ministry, which relates to where we're going today. And these, these men, it says, are full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit. And the result of them being chosen for this ministry is that the gospel spreads even further. And the number of disciples, it says, in Jerusalem increases rapidly. Um, then we see Stephen. Uh, you know, one of these deacons, full of God's grace and power, performing signs and wonders, sharing the gospel, um, and opposition arises from a Jewish sect who stir up trouble with other elders and teachers of the law. And Stephen's put on trial, where again, what happens? He shares the gospel. He shares the gospel boldly. And we read that Stephen is filled with the Spirit, and then he sees a vision. Uh, he looks and he sees a vision of Jesus and and his exclamation of this results in him being stoned to death at the end of Acts 7. He's the first martyr. And the reason I say all this is Acts shows us it's full of people being filled with the Holy Spirit in every single chapter. In fact, Luke wrote Acts. If you read Luke's gospel, that's actually also how Luke's gospel starts. You know, you get these, you know, generally it's, 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 it's pregnant mothers being filled with the Spirit. And it's, it's incredible what happens as, as the birth of the Messiah takes place. But now with the birth of the church, there's people being filled with the Spirit left, right and center. And, um, and we could go on. And we can see that some of the most remarkable moves of God are yet to come. But whenever the Holy Spirit fills people in Acts, extraordinary things happen and we see the kingdom of God advance. Um, and even, as we shall see following on from Stephen's death at the end of Acts 7, the church is sent in the power, that the dunamis, dynamite power of the Holy Spirit to see salvation and transformation in the name of Jesus to the glory of God the Father. And, and, and up until now, if you read um, that statement from Acts 1 verse 8, you could say Acts 1 to 7, that you could call that Jerusalem, right? Because he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. So far, it's just been Jerusalem. But now something groundbreaking takes place, and it's Acts 8 I want us to, to look at today. So we pick it up in Acts 8 verse 1. And uh, yeah, if you've got your Bibles, you want to follow this chapter along. Um, and we read this. 
On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Let's read that bit from uh, verse 1 again. It says, on that day, and, and it's referring to that the same day, the very same day that Stephen was stoned to death. A great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And you might stop there and you might think, this sounds like really bad news. The church has been growing rapidly up to this point, but, you know, what's going to happen now? You know, this, this could be the end of it all. But then if you look at the second half of verse 1, it says, All except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, which I think is fascinating because Jesus said, as we said, they'd be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. But it takes this persecution in order for them to actually go. And, um, and, and, and actually, that shouldn't surprise us because in light of the cross, even the enemy's worst attacks can be turned around for good. You know, the enemy attacks and the kingdom advances. The darkest moment, actually, for the Jerusalem church so far is the moment that the gospel actually goes and advances into Judea and Samaria. And we learn later in Acts 11, actually, that some of those scattered through the persecution following Stephen's, um, Stephen's martyring, actually, they traveled to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, which was the launch pad for God's missions of the whole Gentile world. So in other words, we, we, need, to, we need to understand um, that God is the one who is sovereign over absolutely everything. When we think about being sent in the power of the Holy Spirit, we have to understand God is the one who is who's working his purposes out through us um, by his power. And um, even at the most unlikely moment, you know, and this could, this could relate to our lives too, even the, even the point where we might think, it's finished now, all hope's gone. You know, I don't know what, what's going to happen next. Um, you know, maybe the enemy might have seemed to have won in a particular situation or something. But that could be the very moment that could precede a mighty move of God's spirit advancing his kingdom. And in fact, church history tells us again and again that, that often preceding, you know, preceding a great move of God, you know, sometimes the, the, the years and decades leading up to that can look pretty grim and pretty desolate in a lot of places. But that's the, that's the very place where God chooses to reveal his power and, and his light and his life. And, and that this shouldn't surprise us because we worship a saviour who in his darkest moment, you know, not just for himself but for the world, was actually simultaneously winning the ultimate victory, you know, through which the kingdom of God would actually break into this world once and for all and will one day fill the whole earth. So in our... In our small corner of the world, in Kent um, or East Sussex, wherever we find ourselves, we need to remember that Jesus has won. And he's done everything necessary, actually, to save battle. You know, he's done everything necessary to save battle and the surrounding villages. Uh, he has won the victory. And, and if we trust him fully, then even when we feel at our weakest or think it's impossible, he can do it. Why? Because the, 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 the dunamis, dynamite power of the Holy Spirit is actually at work in us. And this, and you know, in Ephesians 1, Paul says, this is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. In other words, this is the same power that can turn death into life, that can turn darkness into light, that can turn defeat into ultimate victory. And so if that power of God is at work in you, then God can turn anything around. He can do it. You know, he, he has done it. He's won the victory. And, and ultimately, Jesus will be all in all. He will have the supremacy in everything. So let's continue reading Acts 8 from verse 4. It says, Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. 
And, and you know, the second thing, when we, when we look at this, I, I want us to see is that, that God can use anybody and wants to use everyone by the power of the Holy Spirit, wherever we find ourselves. Um, you know, I know recently you've looked at um, being a frontline church, you know, and I, I suppose this is right in, but this is just a reminder of that, really, that this mission involves everybody, everywhere, every day, being sent in the power of the Holy Spirit. So verse 4 says, those who'd been scattered preached the word wherever they went. You know, those who were scattered, whoever they were, we don't know who they all were, but we just know that wherever they went, they preached the word. It was everybody, everywhere. And then we get an example of Philip. It says, Philip, you know, it's just like, you know, Luke wants to just give us an example here. Here's just one story. Just imagine if there were lots, if there's, other, if there's lots of other stories like Philip's, which I believe there are, then that's, that's incredible, isn't it? But just, just to give you one example, Philip went down and preached in Samaria. And, um, and we should pause, actually, and we should think, Philip, Philip, where have I heard that name before? Because the answer is Acts 6. Philip was one of the seven men chosen who were full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom to be deacons, to serve the poor in Jerusalem, to ensure the food distribution was done in a way that was fair and equitable. And now Philip finds himself in a new situation. But here's something really important. What, what he doesn't think is this, okay? And I, and I know we, we can sometimes think like this. He doesn't think, I'm a deacon. My job is to serve the poor and to distribute food. That's what I know how to do. That's what I'm good at. Um, that's what's been recognized. I couldn't possibly do this. You know, that's someone else's job. You know, I can't possibly, um, in this case, share the gospel to a whole new people group in Samaria. Now, we can sometimes do that, can't we? Say, so, ah, oh, you know, I'm Mark. This is what I do. This is what I'm getting for. This is what I don't do. I'm, I've kind of put myself in this box, and, um, and that's, where, that's where I belong, and that's where I'm comfortable. Philip doesn't, doesn't do that. Thank God he doesn't do that. <laughs> what he does, not only does he share the gospel, also he performs signs and wonders, and he sees people delivered from evil spirits and healed. And you've got to think, what's happening here? Philip was a deacon. Now he's behaving like an apostle. You know why? Because God can and will use any of us as he pleases. That's God's prerogative. He can and will use any of us as he pleases. We are filled with the same spirit. Every one of us who trusts in Jesus, we're filled with the same spirit who filled the apostles. You know, and, and, and in fact, you know, as we said, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the power that Jesus was filled with as he performed in his, his earthly ministry. And, and the word apostle, it simply means sent one. You know, it comes from the Greek word apostello, to send. So Philip and all these other people who were scattered preaching the gospel wherever they went, they were, they were sent ones of God. Uh, you know, they were involved. You know, apostello, to send, is the same as that Greek word missio we looked at earlier. So Philip has an apostolic ministry. He sees the gospel break into Samaria. And I've often wondered why Jesus says to the apostles, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And then the 12 seem to stay in Jerusalem throughout most of the book of Acts. You know, I don't know if you've ever wondered that. Maybe it's just me. And I've often thought it's no wonder that Luke, the writer of Acts, he starts to... He shifts the narrative over to Paul, doesn't he, quite quickly. I mean, I know he accompanied him on the journey. But, um, but you know, and then he starts naming all sorts of other people like Barnabas and Silas as being uh, like apostles. And, and, you know, I think, oh, well, they actually went out. Um, and, and at one point, I, I, I thought, you know, maybe, maybe Luke starts to recognize, you know, oh, these people are actually the ones carrying out this mandate. But I think there's more important significance to this. And I know the 12 did go out to other places. Don't get me wrong. But I think this is it. I think from early on, others were empowered by the Holy Spirit, the sending spirit. And they were released. And they took the gospel to new places because it was never meant to be focused on the apostles. <laughs> and we're learning something important from the beginning of the book of Acts that the whole church is sent. That, that mission, as we just said, is everyone, everywhere, every day. It's not about a few anointed people. That, you know, it's about an anointed church. And, um, and if you think about it, if Jesus is the anointed one, 
You know, that's who he is. That's one of his titles. He is the anointed one. Then if we are his body, we are anointed. <laughs> we are all anointed. We are, if, you know, Paul talks about us being in Christ. So if you are in Christ, you are in his anointing. Um, you are anointed. And so the church is apostolic. You know, some Christians in this town will say this every week in the creeds. You know, we are one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And, um, and so, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is for Battle Baptist Church, you have an apostolic call to this town and the surrounding area. You have been sent here for a purpose. The Holy Spirit is on you for a reason. And, and each one of you, wherever you find yourselves, you know, need to remember you are sent in the power of the Holy Spirit to bring the kingdom of God to those round about you. And you can do it, um, you know, if you allow the Spirit to work through you. So wherever you find yourself this time tomorrow, or whoever you come into contact with this week, remember you've been sent by Jesus and appointed by God, and he will use you wherever you find yourselves, if you will let him. And eventually, you'll be pleased to know, and we read in verses 14 to 17, that actually Peter and John, two of the apostles, they do catch up with what's going on. Um, they, they, they hear about it. They go. They pray for people. What do they pray for them? Yeah, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the most important thing. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're going, the whole church needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It needs to go on being filled if we're going to achieve the purposes of Jesus and see this gospel reach the whole world. And, um, and then we read about a fascinating encounter with Simon the sorcerer. We're not going to go into that today because we want to get to the end of the chapter. And, um, and then actually the, the apostles, Peter and John, they too actually go and preach in many Samaritan villages on their way back to Jerusalem. But it is Philip in the power of the Holy Spirit who introduces the gospel to Samaria and, and others like him. Later in the chapter, we read of another groundbreaking encounter. And this is, I want us to look at this. Um, so we're going to continue reading from verse 26 to the end. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candace, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. You see, the Holy Spirit is the one who breaks down boundaries and pioneers and reaches new people and places. But he does that through us. It's his work that we get to be involved. Yeah, actually, it, it's important to realize this because if it hinged on us, and sometimes we can think of that, we can all get into a mood of saying, I've got to, you know, I've got to somehow do it. I've got to do it. And we start working in our own strength. That's exhausting and it's futile and it, it doesn't work. And it certainly doesn't produce any lasting fruit. But it's his work and we get to be part of it. And that's much more exciting. And we see this in this next encounter. 
Philip actually, he gets a bit of direction from an angel, which is really useful. And it's not a particularly common experience, probably for most of us. But we might have some, some stories around this, which you can share afterwards. But, um, but I don't want us to focus on the extraordinary elements of this, because actually there's some, there's some everyday um, principles here also for us to learn from. And so he's told to go south on the, the desert road from Jerusalem to Gaza, which, are, again, I'm sure is an area very much on our hearts at the moment that we're praying for. And I don't know what Philip was expecting as he went out, because he wasn't really told anything. He was just told, go there. Um, but I, I think he certainly wasn't expecting to meet an Ethiopian eunuch who served as treasurer in the Ethiopian royal household. You know, I just think that wasn't what, I don't think that's the person he was expecting to meet. Um, but, but Philip is like, right, this is, this is it. And the Holy Spirit tells him, you know, the Holy Spirit says, go up to that chariot. And he finds the man is reading from Isaiah, the prophet. And if you look at what Philip does, he just asks a simple question. He just says, oh, do you understand what you're reading? But it opens up the opportunity to sit and explore the scriptures with him, which, uh, you know, which must have been an amazing opportunity. But I think the most astonishing thing that Philip must have thought is the passage the eunuch was reading. You know, if you're going to come alongside someone and they're just reading scripture and they don't understand it and they say, can you explain this to me? And then the passage says he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. You're thinking, wow. Thank you, Jesus. Of all the passages in all the scriptures, you get just a brilliant, clear, prophetic passage that points towards Jesus Christ. And, um, and the openness of the eunuch's questions leads to, obviously, an amazing conversation about Jesus in all the scriptures. And then the Ethiopian's like, I want to respond. And I want to, I want to be baptized. And there's so much that we could say. And you will have probably, some of you will have heard sermons talking about all the reasons that when the eunuch went to worship in the temple in Jerusalem, he wouldn't really have been able to do an awful lot or get past a number of barriers because he was Ethiopian, he was a eunuch. There were all of these restrictions that would have been placed on him um, and these barriers that meant he couldn't get really anywhere near to um, where the, the worship and the sacrifices and, 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 and the, certainly where the presence of God was. Um, and, and so he would have just faced all of these frustrations. But now he hears about Jesus and he's like, what's stopping me? And he's got it. You know, the Holy Spirit's opened his eyes. He's like, what, what's preventing me being baptized? He knows the answer. There's nothing. I'm going to dive straight in. And, um, and, and so there's this wonderful moment, this wonderful testimony. And, um, and he seizes the moment. He didn't need asking twice. But I want us to think about Philip and being sent by the Spirit. Because Philip didn't do anything clever in this passage. He was just obedient. He was obedient to the Holy Spirit. You know, there's fascinating elements, yes, to the story. But if we get to the heart of it, it's very simple. You know, he was obedient. And this is one thing I know for certain, that if we're willing to be obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit, which can just be a, a simple prompt or a thought or... Just go up to that person there or you, someone just catches your eye and you don't realize why. And you think, OK, I'm going to go and just talk to them and see if they're OK. Or, or, you you know, whatever those prompts are that you receive, if we're willing to be obedient to the Spirit, God can do amazing things through us. And we can see people come to know Jesus as well. I'm, I'm certain because the Spirit is longing to draw people to Jesus. You know, he is... He is at work right across our community. He is already doing all kinds of things we don't even know about. And he's already at work in people's hearts like that of the Ethiopian eunuch. He set it up, you know, just like he does here for Philip. And, and then he just says, right, now you go in. <laughs> go in and finish the job, you know. And, and so if we are willing to be obedient to the Spirit and be on board with his plans, we will certainly see him move and work and do amazing things. You know, I'm always reminded, whenever I read this, I think, you know what, Lord, I'm sure there's people who live you know, next door to many of us um, who just gladly receive Jesus if only they were given the opportunity. And that's why we've been sent. But I think the key question, it hinges on, will we be obedient to the Holy Spirit? And that's so important. 
you know, yes, we want to be filled with the Spirit. We want to be baptized in the Spirit. Yes, we want the, the gifts of the Spirit that we can use because they're a free gift given to us. We can, we can use them as, you know, in some sense, actually, as we, as we wish, but hopefully also under the Spirit's guidance. But actually, we also need to say, Holy Spirit, we're willing to be obedient to you. We're willing to do what you say and, and to go where you want us to go. And I think for some of us, that might mean we need to put behind maybe past disappointments that we might have had or, or fear of failure. Or sometimes we just need to clear some of the other unimportant stuff out of our lives that really doesn't matter very much. But we all know what that is for each of us. You know, I certainly have a lot of stuff that gets in the way at times. And, and, and you know, also, I think if you spend most of your life, and I've noticed this, about myself and about others, but if we spend too much of our lives worrying about ourselves, we'll probably never share the gospel with anyone. That's also true. You know, so often we need to uh, think about ourselves much less than we do and allow Jesus to take care of our problems and so that we can trust God and look out for those people who actually, because they don't have Jesus, they probably have much bigger problems than we have. And, um, and, you know, we will find those people out there like the Ethiopian eunuch. And so through being willing to be sent and obedient to go this, this one, to this one person, again, a whole new people group were opened up. You know, Philip didn't just, in this chapter, Philip's taking the gospel to Samaria, but actually he's also really taking it to Ethiopia as well. And, um, and the ends of the earth actually begin to be reached and the Orthodox Church in Ethiopia traces its roots back to Philip still. So there's this incredible legacy. And so I think the question for us as a church, you know, as we are willing to be led by the Spirit, sent by the Spirit, is what will our legacy be? You know, are we willing to be sent? Are we trusting in the sovereign power of God at work in and through us and in this community that he can do something mighty even if we feel quite weak actually ourselves? Do we believe God can do it? And are we willing for the Spirit to use us wherever we are, you know, in our everyday, um, for our whole lives to be caught up in the mission of God and to be obedient to Jesus? Will we be obedient to the Holy Spirit? This is what being a disciple is all about. So I think maybe this, where we want to land today is just a point of surrendering to God, a surrendering to the Spirit. And maybe we can just spend a moment. And um, yeah, maybe you want to maybe you want to close your eyes for a moment. Maybe you want to put your you might want to put your hands out. And say, okay, Lord, I'm just I'm ready to receive from you. I want to be open to you. Um, you know, and the reason I say surrender is because very often this is the place I find myself needing to come again and again and again and again to surrender to God once more and to the leading of the Spirit. Yes, yeah, so Lord God, we just, uh, I just want to ask right now at the start of this, you'll help us to let go of anything that we are holding too tightly to. Um, yeah, maybe it's just, as you're, just as you're inviting God to move, maybe you want to empty yourself of anything that will hold you back. You know, say goodbye to, to things like fear or living for self or worries or comforts, apathy. Sin, shame, guilt, disappointment, control. Lord, we surrender these things to you. Jesus, thank you that you have, you have nailed these things to the cross. Um, everything that would hold us back. You say to throw off everything that hinders us and the, the sin that so easily entangles. And so, Lord, today we just, um, we just say, God, we, we trust you. And I just ask you to lift burdens from us in this room today. Um, lift any burden that, that this is something that we've somehow got to do in our own strength or that we've, um, we've somehow got to make it happen. Because, Lord, we know the church uh, never anticipated how you were going to open up Samaria and Ethiopia and all these places. It was You were the one. You were the one who did it. And we want to be a part of what you're doing. So, Holy Spirit, um, help us to surrender to you this morning. And we ask that you would release a fresh anointing on us today.
release a fresh anointing on your church, uh, that we will see doors opening that we never anticipated, and we will we will have the agility um, to just be able to go where you lead us. Um, Lord, not a physical agility, but a spiritual agility that this church would have, and that we would um, be obedient to what you are calling us to do, and that it will be that wherever we go, this church will be like that church scattered through Samaria, that wherever we go, we will be the ones uh, sharing the gospel. We will be the hands and feet of Jesus, because there, there is such an anointing on our lives. So Holy Spirit, fill us afresh with your power. May we receive power. May we be clothed with power from on high. This mission you've called us to do. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in battle, in Catsfield and Ninfield and Robertsbridge and Hastings and St. Leonard's and to the ends of the earth. You can't do it alone, but with him you can. So we just say, come Holy Spirit and lead us.